thank you, uh, friends. Uh, Professor Sayyid Anul Hassan, Honorable Vice Chancellor, is chairing this session, and Professor Amir Kalam is the guest speaker. Uh, so, with the permission of Chair, we are now formally starting this program. Uh, friends, as you are aware, this lecture is part of G20 University Connect program, mandated to be conducted in educational institutions countrywide as per the instruction of the UGC. We are happy that we, we could bring Professor Amy Kalam on board to talk on a very important theme, uh, much more important in our times that we are living in today. We are immensely grateful to Professor Kalam for accepting our uh, request and being part of this important G20 University Connect program at MANO. Uh, with these words, I invite Professor P.H. Muhammad to say a few words about the theme and introduce the guest speaker of the day briefly. Today's speaker and the guest, Professor Emir Kalam, respected chair of the session, Professor Syed Ainul Hassan, the Honorable Chancellor of Manu, my friends and colleagues from this vibrant Manu community, dignitaries from outside, I welcome you all to this lecture today on diversity versus pluralism in G20 nations, being organized by the Department of Sociology in collaboration with the Center for the Study of Social Exclusion Inclusive Policy under the banner of the G20 G20 Nations University Connect program series. Friends, as my colleague Dr. Sai said, and as you all know that India holds the presidency of the G20, a premier, premier forum for international economic cooperation that plays an important role in shaping and strengthening global architecture and governance on, on all major international economic and other issues since it was founded as a forum first in uh, 1999 and then getting upgraded to the level of heads of state in the wake of the global economic crisis in 2007 and 2009. Friends, this G20 summit is held annually under the leadership of a rotating presidency and India holds the presidency of the G20 from 1st December 2022 to 30th November 2023 and thus we are celebrating the occasion in several manner, and thus the G20 University Connect program is one such. The lecture today on the stated topic assumes significance since the theme of India's G20 presidency is Vastu Daiva Kutumbam, or one earth, one family, one future, which is drawn from the ancient Sanskrit text, text of the Maha Upanishad essentially affirming the value of all life, that is human, animal, plant, microorganisms, and their interconnectedness on the planet Earth and in the wider universe. Today, today's lecture also attains importance because the logo and the theme together convey a powerful message of India's G20 presidency, which is of striving for just and equitable growth of all in the world, as we navigate through these turbulent times in a sustainable, holistic, responsible, and inclusive manner. Friends, this lecture is also contextual because for India, the G20 presidency also marks the beginning of Amrit Kal, that is the beginning of 25th, 25-year period from the 75th anniversary of its independence on 15th August 2022 leading up to the central uh, centenary of its independence towards a futuristic, prosperous, inclusive and developed society distinguished by a human-centric approach at its core. In this background, friends, when diversity means uh, to acknowledge what we are in terms of, you know, coexistence of different socio-cultural groups and pl pluralism is beyond this, you know, pluralism beyond the diversity. It is not just acknowledging the diversity that we exist so, but it is promoting, promoting the diversity in terms of inclu uh, including uh, giving the measures in constitution, constitution and all, which we are uh, enjoying. Uh, so given this, we chose this topic rising to the occasion and we felt that it is justified if we have this lecture by the personality like Professor Kalam, because of the academic integrity, academic dignity, he carries with an ultra-rich academic uh, scholarship, his acumenship, his experience, and whatnot. So, uh, given this, I request the chair to 
permit me to place the brief biodata of Professor Kalam before you. Professor Dr. M. A. Kalam is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Peninsula Foundation and concurrently a visiting professor at Center for Economic and Social Studies, Hyderabad. He was a Dean School of Liberal Arts, Social Sciences and Professor of Anthropology, SRM University, Amaravati, Andhra Pradesh. Also, he was founding Dean Heading Administration Regulatory Affairs and Professor of Anthropology at Kriya University, Sri City, Andhra Pradesh. Prior to that, he was Professor of Eminence at Tejpur University, Assam. Uh, and also, he was Professor and Head Department of Anthropology and Chairperson, that is Dean uh, School of Social Sciences, you know. University of Madras. Dr. Kalam was a Rockefeller resident fellow at Duke University, Human Rights Fellow at Harvard University, and Commonwealth Academic Staff Fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He was visiting professor at universities in France. He was also at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla. Dr. Kalam's doctoral research was among the Kurks, that is Kodabas in Karnataka, Subsequently, he has studied the mass religious conver conversions in Tamil Nadu, internal and overseas migrations, seasonal, seasonal migrant labor and religious and linguistic minorities. Also, he has undertaken anthropological fieldwork among South Asians in England, the USA, and France. He has participated in post-tsunami rehabilitation and reconstruction work in Thailand, Sri Lanka and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Dr. Kalam has been a consultant to ministries of the Government of India, Danida, NACO, and so on. Currently, he is on the board, board of Bharat Rural Livelihood Foundation. Dr. Kalam has extensive administrative experience. He, has, he was on the board of management of Tejpur Central University, Assam, and on the planning board of Pondicherry Central University. He was covering council member. Uh, he was governing council member of the Indian Council of Social Science Research, that is ICSR. Uh, he was also he has also served as a member of the expert group on diversity index, Ministry of Minority Affairs, Government of India. This uh, diversity index, in fact, our uh, uh, Professor Amitabh Kundu was the chairman of this diversity group, of which Dr. Kalam was a member. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Kalam continues to publish extensively, not just academically, not just academically, but also in newspapers, uh, news portals, and periodicals. Dr. Kalam has been a sports person and has represented his college, university, and state in football, hockey, cricket, and athletics. Friends, we have two great uh, scholars and cricketers on the dais today. Uh, you know, you, uh, you must be knowing that I am told, Professor. Uh, Ainul Hasan Saab also was a good cricket player uh, in JNU. So in our last seminar, somebody was referring that. Otherwise, I did not know this uh, uh, thick thing. So friends, apart from this, Dr. Kalam has served as a cricket umpire for the Tamil Nadu Cricket Association. Dr. Kalam was president of the Guayar Hall Students Union in Delhi University. He has participated in the TV rounds of the BBC Mastermind Quiz. And uh, Dr. Kalam has won the, UN won the UNESCO Photography Prize for Asia and the Pacific, showing that he is a good, he has interest in photography also. Friends, with this uh, rich bio biodata, I, I thank you one and all. I, I thank uh, particularly Professor Aino Lassan Saab for giving us the opportunity and also Professor M.A. Kalam for uh, you know, honoring our uh, request to uh, come and stay with us and give a, give a, give, a, give the series of lectures in uh, in the in Manu. Thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, locating the theme in a context, especially mentioning uh, the Indian uh, idols of Vasudev Kuntumbakam and the subsequent uh, this uh, ideal of Amrit Kal. Uh, well, there is a, a really a felt need of critically examining uh, the state of diversity and pl pluralistic traditions in India and across the world. 
uh, especially in the time as I was, uh, I mean, briefly uh, referring to uh, the lurking danger of uh, ethno-nationalism, majoritarianism with an unusual blend of neoliberalism. Because in this context, the very conception of, uh, very political conception of democracy is turning into an economic conception of democracy. Uh, the state is also now started cons uh, considering its own citizenry as a consumer. So the profit and loss has become the corner store of modern democracies. So in this context, I think it's very important to understand uh, the issue of uh, diversity and pluralism. How, what is the state of this in India and across the world? Uh, with these words, I invite uh, Professor Amikala to deliver his talk. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning to you all. Professor uh, Syed Dainul Hassan Sahab, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Manu, and then Professor Mohammed, the head of the Department of Sociology Department, and Dr. Syed, who is here. Thank you very much for the kind words, and th I thank the University of uh, uh, the Manu University, plus the Departments of Sociology and the Center for Social Exclusion and In Inclusive Policies for having me here this morning. And it's a great privilege that I could sit with the Honorable Vice Chancellor Sahab, whom I had the pleasure of, uh, or the honor of listening on 15th, when he briefly was giving exposition when uh, Umar Khalidi's uh, hall was being inaugurated. I, I happened to be there. I had just arrived from Chennai on that day. And in incidentally, Umar Khalidi happened to be a good friend of mine. And we knew each other for quite a long time, and uh, we used to exchange ideas and uh, sometimes visits uh, both uh, in the US and also he had visited us in Chennai. Therefore, it was nice to listen to some of the small things which Professor Hassad uh, uh, was talking about. And one of the things I think I will be alluding to that later in my lecture, he mentioned something about identity. And uh, that was something I think was, was very good. It was brief, but to the point and uh, exactly what I think a social science should, scientist should be doing when he referred to that, and also the Banaras connection that he had. Okay, with these words, uh, uh, I would like to give a short kind of an exposition in terms of what exactly G20 means. And some of you, I think, by now are familiar because probably you have already listened to certain things which people have spoken about uh, at the university in terms of what G20 is about. Uh, G20 was established in 1999. Uh, it was subsequent to the financial crisis which was there in Asia during 97 and 98. And after that, uh, the international forum, which consists of the governments and the central bank governors of 19 countries and the European Union. European Union, by the way, has got 20, 27, 28 countries together. And that's an important kind of a thing because some of the people who are some of the countries which are part of the European Union are also part of the, the G20, for instance, Germany and France. So uh, it's interesting to see, and I will be alluding again later to what, uh, how the European Union came about. Now, G20 deals with the global economic issues, uh, promotes financial stability, and tries to foster what you could look at as sustainable and inclusive economic growth among the member countries. But then when you talk about the member countries, the others who are not part of it also get involved in some way or the other. Therefore, it's not an exclusive G20 group which is there. G20 is there as a group, no doubt. But then the interactions which take place between G20 and the other nations, they are not are they outside the group, but they are not outside the universe. Therefore, I think that's the other thing which happens. And uh, uh, please bear with me. I will read out the G20 country names in alphabetical order so that some of you who are not familiar would know what the countries are. They are uh, alphabetically Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey or Turkey, United Kingdom, United States, and the European Union, where you have the group of countries coming together and forming a union. Now, from South Asia, if you have 
as as you have followed the uh, 20 uh, member countries that i talked about from south asia there is no other country besides india in the group therefore our neighbors pakistan bangladesh and sri lanka are not members of the g20 now no doubt all the g20 countries show some diversity and there is no country today uh, where the cosmopolitanism cosmopolitanism has not come into play and therefore any country anywhere in the world that you take up will definitely show some diversity but for our purpose today we will deal with some of the ones which are very significant and therefore i will be uh, referring to certain things in terms of diversity and later we will go to the idea of pluralism uh, in india and i will make some references to canada because that's an important kind of a country in terms of how it handles multiculturalism and then we will also look at how united states also has certain things in terms of the idea are going towards pluralism the others as i said have uh, diversity to different degrees but this diversity the, these countries that i am looking at india united kingdom united states and canada i'll take up because if i take up the examples of the other countries i think we may need a whole day therefore i will allude to certain things only this now the diversity in a country any country that you take up for that matter signifies the presence of different religious groups caste groups linguistic groups it could also be regional and other ethnic markers which could be there and also now this has become quite important and also the supreme court judgment the other thing which has happened in india and the other places in the world where certain provisions have been given sexual orientation also is taken into consideration when we talk about diversity now multiculturalism is another word which is used very frequently as a co- as a concept and uh, when we talk about the manifestation of cultural differences multiculturalism and plural societies are also something which we talk about but then plural society or a multicultural society is there in terms of the diversity that it shows but these are not or do not have as we examine as we examine now pluralism so therefore i think it's important to recognize the fact that multiculturalism or plural societies by themselves show diversity but they need not be working towards or have worked towards pluralism so we will come to that after we do this. so there's no country in the world uh for instance that shows the kind of diversity which india has got now most of you or all of you in fact are familiar with africa and if you look at africa the different countries which are there the borders which are there between the different countries in africa straight line boundaries because those were not done on the basis of any natural kind of things in terms of mountains or lakes or rivers or something those were done on the basis of colonial powers which were ruling different parts of africa therefore you have straight line boundaries now my point is that in case you dissolve all those straight line boundaries in africa and look at the diversity probably india would still be more diverse than what you find there therefore that's the kind of thing which we talk about when we talk about diversity in india and then this as i, I emphasized earlier has to do with religion in terms of the differences which are there between the different groups of people it has to do with caste it has to do with regionalism language and so forth so there could be different kinds of markers which you could take up to talk about diversity now besides the diversity that we are familiar with in the regions for instance if you take up the five southern states most of us know what the diversity is like but unfortunately it so happens that one pocket of the country which where, where there are seven eight states eight states if we include sikkim what is known as the northeast and earlier it was known as seven sisters now we have got the eight sisters or seven sisters and one brother whatever the way you want to look at it not many people are familiar with what happened there now today because of the diversity which is there certain tensions can come about amongst different groups of people and what's happening in manipur today is a manifestation of the presence of diverse groups who have tension between them and manipur has hold your breath 34 tribal groups but when we read in the newspapers we read about the metis 
the cookies and the naga group or some naga groups which join the cookies and they have a conflict together with the metis now we spent uh, me and my wife and sometimes our daughter used to come and spend time with us four years in assam at the central university in tezpur and we had the opportunity to travel all over and uh, arunachal pradesh mizoram and uh, nagaland need you need inner line permit to travel there in spite of the fact that you are all indian citizens if you want to go to these states so we lived in assam and the identity card from the central university in tezpur was so strong that the inner line permit was sometimes not emphasized on when we used that and if we used an official vehicle we could travel around and let me tell you it's such a fascinating area which most of us are not drawn. fascinating not in terms of tourist thing but also fascinating in terms of social science perspective in terms of the kind of people who are there so adjacent to manipur is the state of nagaland and nagaland has got 16 officially recognized naga groups now these 16 naga groups it may come as a surprise to you when they talk to each other they don't understand each other's languages the languages are so distinct in spite of the fact that they inhabit the same region called nagaland and officially 16 of them are there and some of them uh, i will name a few are the angami naga the awa naga the konyak naga the lotas rengma seminama now chankeshek now 16 of them naga groups now what happens is adjacent state of assam and manipur also has got certain naga groups and officially nagaland does not recognize them as nagas but the self definition of these diverse groups which are there in manipur and uh, assam is that they are nagas now to a social scientist the self definition that people give is very important an outsider may look at a group of people in a different way but then the self definition what you think and that's the thing i think professor hasan was talking about briefly at that time when he talked about identities for instance his identity as a person from banaras is one and people can have multiple identities uh, you are from banaras that's one identity you are a jnu and you, you as a jvan jnuite whether you are on the right or the left irrespective of that you have an identity and then when you are at manu you are the vice chancellor there or the faculty and you have another identity so people can have multiple identities and what's important is that at different points in time people will emphasize one of those identities and irrespective of the fact that they have multiple identities is also important that outsider's perspective of looking at a group of people always differs or may differ compared to how people define themselves so the metis and the nagas uh, so, uh, and the cookies are having problems also not just because they are tri- different groups but the metis consider themselves and they are recognized as hindus and the cookies and the naga groups which are there they are all christians so there's another point of conflict between them in spite of the fact that they are different groups by themselves okay so that's one kind of diversity that we have got now let me also give an example of diversity within the same religion for instance now i'm sure most of you are familiar with pakistan and i had the opportunity of working with pakistanis in bradford in england uh because i had a fellowship from the london school of economics to do field work to look at how ethnicity works and outside the country context for instance they all started from india before 1947 and then 1947 there was a division which happened because of partition in india and all these groups of people who live for instance in a single street howard street in bradford from being indians they got differentiated as indians and pakistanis then in 1971 when bangladesh came up then between the pakistanis themselves there was another kind of a schism whereby pakistanis became pakistanis and bangladeshis now what happened at the country level at their own subcontinent level was also being represented and then manifested in a completely different kind of a situation and therefore if you look at the settlement pattern in bradford if anybody has visited bradford uh, you find that the pathans live separately in an enclosure i mean not exactly enclosure but they live separately in it so they have formed 
uh, what in social science has sometimes is used as the word as ghetto because you concentrate yourself in one particular locality. Therefore, the Pathans, uh, the, 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 the Punjabis, and then the Sindhis, the division started happening first on the basis of nation, I mean, as citizenship, which they lost from Indians to Pakistanis. And then from among themselves, when the group started growing, they had, start, they had formed different groups which are there. Therefore, today in Pakistan, in spite of the fact as to what, how they represent themselves outside, you have four major official, almost, almost officially recognized four different groups, and they call themselves as the Qaum. And then the English near, 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 nearest English translation which I could make for Qaum is nation. Therefore, you have Punjabis, Balochis, Sindhis, and Pakhtuns or Pathans as the four groups which are there. And they self-define themselves as Qaum. Therefore, what comes is as a kind of a nationality. But what's interesting is, post-1947, when a group of people went from India to Pakistan, who are the Mohajirs, who are known as the Mohajirs, they want the fifth nationality and to be recognized separately as that. And therefore, the MQM, which was earlier uh, Mohajir Qaumi movement, Altaf Hussein in London and the other groups of people, they started agitating for different kinds of rights to be given to the fifth nationality, which the Pakistani state hasn't recognized in a way. And then uh, at some point, they didn't want to have Mohajir Qaumi movement as the term, therefore, is, they have changed it to Mutahidda Qaumi movement. So the point is that there are, within the same religious group, different kinds of uh, divisions which can happen, and they do operate and present themselves at the level. Now, the other neighbor that we have got is also a very interesting kind of thing in terms of diversity, and that's Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, you have got the Sinhalis who are dominating and have been having a long civil war, which supposed to have ended in 2009, when Prabhakaran was shot dead, uh, but then, we don't, we, we don't think that that has ended. So you have this dominant Sinhalis, then you have in the north and east a group of people known as the Sri Lankan Tamils. Now there are Tamils who have gone to Sri Lanka but call themselves the Jaffna Tamils or the Sri Lankan Tamils. Then there is one more bigger group, larger than the Sri Lankan Tamils, who are known as the Indian Tamils or the Hill Tamils, and these are people who worked on plantations and they were taken by the British, as they did to so many other places, like the West Indies, South Africa, and so many different places, indentured labor. And for first it was slavery, later it became indentured labor, like they took them, so these people were there. Therefore, the so-called Sri Lankan Tamils, self-definition of themselves, do not have or do not want to do anything with the Indian Tamils, because Indian Tamils are laborers, come from, uh, supposedly lower caste families, and therefore there's no connection. They don't want to have anything to do with that. But interestingly, among the Jaffna Tamils, there's another smaller group of Muslims who are Tamil speakers. But the Sri Lankan Tamils do not want them to identify themselves as Muslim Tamils. They say that you are Muslims, you should not be identified as Tamils in any way. Now, there's another group known as the Burgers. It's not McDonald's, but then they're known as the burgers because uh, they are the equivalent of the Anglo-Indians in India, the descendants of the colonials and the other Portuguese, Danish, and the English who are there. Their descendants are known as burgers. So that is Sri Lanka's diversity, which is there. Now, closer to home, uh, I mean, closer to uh, the other side of it, we also have one group of people who, uh, are Bangladeshis and then the ex East Pakistan, which is the country in the subcontinent, subcontinent with the least amount of diversity. And therefore, the kind of problems which may exist in a country like Pakistan or Sri Lanka do not come about in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, what we have got is the Muslim population is 91%. This is according to 2020, 2022 census, which they have taken recently. India, of course, we are lagging behind. Our 2021 census has still not started. And whether it will start or not is a different mood point. And then the other thing which is there, besides the, the religion factor of 91% being Muslims, is hold your breath. All groups of people, if you take up all over Bangladesh, 
Bangla as a language is spoken by 99%. Now, the identity which they have as, as one language speakers is quite important in reducing the tensions between them. For instance, whether it is uh, Bangladesh or West Bengal, uh, when, you have, when you look at the Muslims and the Hindus, because of the language factor being common amongst them, there is a lot of camaraderie and there is a lot of uh, a lessening of tensions between them. Now, if you're talking to somebody in West Bengal or Bangladesh, for instance, uh, one of, there are one or two words in Bangla which sometimes may distinguish. For instance, the Hindus will always use the word Jol for water and Muslims will use the word Pani. So there are a couple of words, uh, three or four words which are there in Bangla which distinguish them. Otherwise, there's nothing to distinguish them in literature, language, and other ways. So there's all, all, all very thing, everything is common between the people who are there. And that's the reason why, because of religion being the com common factor up to 91%, and language being the common factor up to 99%, you have less tensions. But then there are other factors I, I don't want to go into, for instance, health and other parameters in terms of uh, women's development, other things. Bangladesh, incidentally, is doing better on those parameters than India. Now, among the countries that we considered earlier, Canada, the United Kingdom, United States, the most diverse country. Now, we started looking at the Indian thing within the nation, I mean, within the country. Then we made a comparison with the neighboring countries in terms of how diversity or what diversity means there. Now we will go over to the international kind of a scene where let's look at what diversity means and how diversity operates in a different kind of a situation. I will take up the example of Canada. Though Canada happens to be the most diverse at the, at, at the international level country today and has been for a very long time. And incidentally, Canada still allows 1% an amount, a group of people equivalent to 1% of their population every day, every year as immigrants. So if you look at 10 years from now, Canada's population, the natural growth will be there on the one side. The other thing which will happen is that about 10% would have grown because immigrants would be coming in from different places. Now, the other thing which is there in Canada is that if you look at the uh, country level uh, statistics in Canada, 20% or one fifth of the population of Canada was foreign born. They, ha they have migrated from there. Therefore, you have four fifths of the people, or 80% were there from the country, but then 20% are in a way, in quotes, you can use the word foreigners. And Canada's largest city, Toronto, is, has got another very interesting feature. 50% of Toronto's population was born outside. So that's the kind of diversity which Canada shows. Now, uh, when you look at the immigrants who are there, the foreign-born people, the, the stream is still continuing. And that's something, I think, why many people sometimes they go directly from here by some way or the other. Uh, and it's rather easier for people to do it. And there are different ways in, in, in which you could do it. Now, having seen and uh, dealt with the diversity aspect uh, in different situations, uh, the Indian country level, then the neighbor, neighborhood subcontinental level, and then uh, also the example that we have from, uh, from Canada, let's look, at, uh, let's look at what pluralism means. Now, <clears throat> while diversity signifies, as we discussed, the presence of different religious groups, caste groups, ling language groups, region, regional groups, as well as different ethnic things, pluralism goes beyond this. Now, how it goes beyond this, I will read up a short kind of a quotation, which will give you a proper kind of a perspective as to what we are talking about uh, when we talk about pluralism. Now, Pluralism is something that refers to a society, system of government, or organization that has different groups that keep their identities while existing with other groups or a more dominant group. Rather than just one group, subgroup, or culture dictating how things should go, 
pluralism recognizes a larger number of competing interest groups that share the power pluralism serves as a model of democracy where different groups can voice their opinions and ideas now as you have seen people can keep their identity in spite of being part of a larger society where there are other dominant groups and they are allowed to do that and keep their identity and then also different groups can voice their opinion and protest against some of the things which are happening now it's for you to see in the light of what i have just read out as a small kind of a quotation whether that happens in india or not so we have diversity but the point is given this definition do you have the scope space for minorities to keep their identity and still participate in the larger uh, uh, larger institutions of the society or the uh, constitutionally and then also to have dissent and uh, not be in hold up for sedition if you have any dissent and can you be part of that kind of a system so that's something which we are talking about now pluralism also signifies a condition in which please note carefully condition in which minority groups participate fully in the dominant society yet maintain their cultural differences and it's a doctrine that a society benefits from such a condition also cultural pluralism seeks to overcome racism sexism and other forms of discrimination now this is very very relevant for the society today in india for us to examine these things that if a minority group is there is the minority group allowed to maintain their uh, identity in spite of their cultural differences and whether they are able to overcome racism sexism and other forms of discrimination is it happening that's the question that we all have to ask when we are talking about pluralism now th this factor of uh, uh, discrimination or uh, minority groups not being allowed to participate fully in the dominant society is is something which i think goes against the constitution uh, some of the earlier articles in terms of equality fraternity and other things which are they show that any group of people should have certain things now let me emphasize another point about what pluralism means pluralism assumes that diversity is beneficial to society and that autonomy should be enjoyed by disparate functional or cultural groups within a society including religious groups trade unions professional organizations and ethnic minorities now to take an aside and go to another kind of a uh, uh, phenomena when we talk when we talk about diversity you have all heard about biodiversity now biodiversity we are talking about on the one hand of course humans can also be part of the larger biodiversity thing there is what is known as a floral biodiversity that in terms of plants and then the faunal biodiversity in terms of animals now if you raise Uh, or completely get rid of a forest you are losing lot of biodiversity in that forest both in terms of flora and fauna now there have been attempts where they talk about this is an example i am giving in order to emphasize the point that i am making uh, they have made attempts what are known as reforestation or, or afforestation now in afforestation most often what happens is that you bring in only one kind of species or two kinds of species and most often it's known as monoculture that is single culture and therefore any attempt which is made where there is immense biodiversity to take that away and put in one single culture like a monoculture is disastrous it can be disastrous for the forest it can be much worse for the human beings now that's the point that you have to take in when we are talk when you have to talk about biodiversity as to what happens when biodiver uh, when diversity gets diluted or diversity is somehow or the other subdued or overpowered and one single culture or one kind of a th uh, uh, idea comes up now that's the thing which you can take up from what can be known as the monoculture and therefore it's pertinent to talk about 
different contexts in which this could happen. And for India, it's as I said in the earlier things, it's quite important. Now, when we talk about uh, different groups of people, I will give two examples where in some cases, different nationalities can come in and form. There's diverse nationalities can come in and form one single group. And the other example would be whereby one single nation or nationality can be divided into different citizens. The first example where different nationalities can come together was, though it may not exist today, but it's important. And uh, in a way, uh, in, a, in a different way, the European Union to some extent comes closer to that. What happened in 1922 was the birth of USSR, United uh, uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. Now, in 1922, a whole lot of countries, 15 republics came together, and they came together and formed the USSR. Now, peoples belonging to the 15 republics, some of them were from Russia, Ukraine, now they have a problem between themselves, Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, Belarusia, Uzbekistan, Armenia, and so many. So these 15 came together, they have different nationalities, and in their passport, and when they represented themselves, they were different nations or different nationalities, but citizens of one single country. And that single country, in a way, at that time was USSR. So citizenship was a different kind of an issue, and then nationality was another kind of issue which was there. Nationalities can come together to form a citizenship. Now, this is again important for India. Now, a contemporary example of something like this could be, like I said, the 27 or 20, 28 countries in Europe who have come together. They are different nations that they have formed a union, and European Union. European Union has got a parliament. It has got uh, it, it, it has got a European Council, a European par Parliament, it's got a single political economic union, but there are people who are members of the respective, I mean, their nation, nationals of different countries like France, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and so on, but they can still form one kind of a union. Now, the different example that I have, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Bedouin. A Bedouin is a group of people all over North Africa, uh, Arabia and so many different places they are there and you will find them in North African countries and uh, Algeria, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, Israel, Syria. Now before the international borders came up between countries there was just one wide expanse and the Bedouin traveled from east to west, north to south, entire area. They had no concept or no idea about what, what countries mean. And later, when the national boundaries or different countries started getting formed, these people got divided into different countries, whether they liked it or not, because of where they were present at a particular point in time. At one point, they were, if not nomadic, they were semi-nomadic, and they moved around openly from different into different places. Therefore, when the citizenship things emerged, the entire wide expanse of North Africa which did not have any international boundaries, started giving them. Therefore, one group of people who identified themselves as a single nation or nationality, the Bedouins, got divided as different citizens. So this is another example, a kind of a counter to what happened in uh, the USSR. Now, one more interesting example of the use of the word citizen and nation and diversity comes from the United States. I don't know how many of you are familiar. In October 1995, uh, there was a person called Louis Farah Khan. Now, Louis Farah Khan organized what is known as the Million Man Ma March in Washington, D.C., in the United States. Now, he pitched himself as a leader of Nation of Islam. This is the terms he used, Nation of Islam. And though the, most of the people predominantly were African Americans, uh, th th these people became part of or went over to uh, co the congregation and it included Muslims of other ethnic backgrounds besides the blacks who were there. And this drew Muslims from various countries also. And the Million, Mar million Man War March, which means million is 10 lakhs, many more people were there besides the million who were there. Therefore, also non-Muslim whites and colored people also participated in this rally in October 1995. 
and uh, one of the professors from Harvard, known as Cornell West, he didn't call himself a Muslim, he was a Christian, but he had participated in this. And uh, Harvard University, somehow or the other, took cudgels against him for having participated in that. Now, liberal universities like Harvard, considered to be liberal universities like Harvard, for instance, can also be very inward looking when certain things happen. So Cornell West, and he had problems, I think he left and then went to some other university and came up. And incidentally, to be a bit immodest, I was present at Harvard University at that time when this was happening. And it was interesting to see what uh, Cornell West's view was. He thought that as a social scientist, he was a professor of literature in English. He, he thought that he could go because he, he, the university did not have full control over him in any way. Now, one more thing I think is very important is there was a professor called Diana Eck at Harvard University in the School of Divinity. She initiated what is known as the Pluralism Project at Harvard University. Now, Diana Eck is something I think I'm not sure if Professor Hassan is aware of it. She worked and did field work in Benares, and she wrote a book called City of Lights. But the criticism of that book is that she, she saw only the lights and the dark corners and the other places which were there were not highlighted by Diana Eck properly. So that's the criticism again. So Diana Eck started what is known as the Pluralism Project. How much of time do I have? It's 37 minutes after I started. Okay, fine. Now, Diana Eck started what is known as the Harvard uh, Pluralism Project, and her main point was that the first point that she took up, she had four main aspects when she talked about uh, when she started this project. And she said that, number one, pluralism is not diversity alone. She said pluralism goes beyond diversity. That was the first point. And she said that religious diversity is a given. That is, is there. Given means it's something there. Religious plural, plural, diversity is there. But pluralism is not a given. Pluralism is something which will come, on, come in as a kind of an achievement. So that was the first point she was highlighting when Diana, started, uh, Diana Eck started this pluralism project. The second point she was talking about is pluralism is not just tolerance, but active seeking of understanding across lines of difference. Now, there are people with differences who are there, and it's not enough just to tolerate them. But you need to be actively participating and seeking to understand why the differences are there. And in spite of the differences, how is it that people are operating and be living in the same kind of a society? So that was the second point which Diana was emphasizing. And then she talked about a third thing where she said that pluralism is not relativism but encounter of commitments. Now, relativism is something where you compare something with something, and you say that in relation to this. So she says that pluralism is not relativism, but encounter of commitments. So people should have a commitment to do certain things, and that's important. And she says further elucidates by saying that it means holding our deepest differences, even our religious differences, not in isolation, but in relationship to one another. So you need to understand if the person, if another person, an alter ego with whom you are having an affiliate, I mean, with, with association or with whom you are having an encounter, how does that person? So it's not enough just to say that, okay, relatively we compare this thing. But she says that it's not in isolation, religious difference, but in relationship to one another. So that she emphasizes as the third point uh, in that project. And then the fourth thing she talks about is that pluralism is based on dialogue. And by that she means dialogue does not mean everyone coming to the table, but they, they will have to agree with one another. So just sitting around is not enough. She says that you need to understand the other people when you come to the table. And she further says pluralism involves the commitment to being at the table with one's commitments. You're fine, you have your commitments and you have your own ideas and ideologies, but still, can you be part of a larger table where you can come and sit with the others which, which, which are there? Now, in, in, in a lecture she gave subsequent to this starting of the pluralism project uh, in 2013, uh, I will read out 
two lines from this. Diana X says that all of America's diversity, old and new, does not add up to pluralism. And she's very, very forthright about it. All of America's diversity, old and new, does not add up to pluralism. Pluralism and diversity are sometimes used as if they were synonyms, but diversity, that is splendid, colorful, and perhaps threatening, is not pluralism. Pluralism is the engagement that creates a common society from all that diversity. So she ended up the lecture by emphasizing that how pluralism is different and just having diversity does not mean. And she's very categorical in saying that pluralism is not a synonym of diversity. Now, uh, Besides the Harvard University project on uh, pluralism, Canada started something in 2011 called Global Center for Pluralism in Ottawa. Now, what the Global Center in Ottawa emphasizes is that individual choices as well as collective compromise and mutual obligation as routes to peace, stability, human development. Now these, they say, are the important factors which are there in pluralism. And they further say that as such, the concept of pluralism speaks to the experiences of countries around the world, regardless of the origins of their respect diversities. So you have diversities, people come from different origins. Now this thought is something which has enabled Canada to allow people or immigrants to come 1% of their population every year and still handle the diversity in a much better way compared to many places, including USA and uh, England for that matter. Now, when we look at these things and the diversity of India, I have a different take when we look at India's constitution. For instance, the preamble to the Indian constitution says, we the people of India. Now, if it is Accident that India has nations that we have different groups of people who are there, then we need to adopt the plural for the word people. So people is something sometimes is more narrower. Therefore, if you say that there are multiple groups of people with different kinds of diversities and they all coexist in the same place, therefore I would say that if we have to take up and recognize the fact that there are multiple groups of people and people have different kinds of uh, backgrounds, but they still hold on to their own identities, then if we have to recognize them in plural, then I think the constitution of India and the preamble should be, we the peoples of India. Now, this is my contention. Now, the constitution of India deals only with issue of citizens and citizenship and does not delve into the realm of nations or nationality. Though over 100 amendments have been made to the Constitution of India, the aspect concerning plurality of the Indian people constituting, constituting nations and conceiving them as nations has hardly been debated either in parliament or among academics or civil society. While it would be more prudent to recognize the plural nature of its peoples and comprehend India as, uh, as comprising different nations as things stand, all citizens of India are perceived as a single nation. Now that's a dangerous kind of a thing. When you look at the country as one single nation, in spite of the fact that people have their identities, they have their groups, they have religions, they have their respect to religions, they have their respect to languages. Therefore, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, when the constitution was being formulated, this idea of uh, emphasizing one single identity irrespective of what was existing wasn't there. And of course, you can't expect everything to, 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 to have been considered by uh, Dr. Ambedkar and his followers. And therefore, I think once we recognize the fact that plurality in terms of peoples is there, then you will also recognize the fact that uh, constructing something as a single kind of a thing will not work. Therefore, uh, what it means that combination of nations instead of states necessarily makes India plural. Indian states in 1956 were reorganized by the SRC, States Reorganization Commission, on the basis of languages. 
the initial everything which happened was, of course, today you may, you may say that that's not true because Telangana and Andhra Pradesh same, share the same language. But original idea of the SRC, if you look at it, the Madras presidency, Bombay presidency and Calcutta presidencies were there. Then after the British left in 1956, the government of India, uh, Nehru was very instrumental in doing it. They established the SRC and then linguistic division of the country took place at that time. Now, I will conclude by reading again a small kind of a thing uh, from my own conclusion, of course. Unity and diversity sounds like a good aphorism. Now, this is something which everybody talks about, unity and diversity. This platitude has been bandied about by all, including politicians, civil society members, and organizations, as well as by academics, as a catch-all phrase for far too long. When we mouth unity and diversity, we seem to assume that it exists. We talk about unity and diversity, and the assumption is that it's there. Given the kind of happenings which have been happening, particularly in the last few years, it's easy to talk about unity and diversity, but difficult to prove that it's actually there. Therefore, uh, we assume that it exists, and it happens, and is thought of as a given. Unity in diversity is not a given. It's a thought process which is there. However, that is a supposition of sorts, though it does not point towards a multicultural situation. But it can indeed be demonstrated, demonstrated that there un undeniably is unity despite diversity. Now, if we can prove that despite the diversity which is there, unity exists, then the aphorism said unity and diversity would be true. But unfortunately, uh, most of us know that it's only a platitude or a kind of a rhetoric which, which, which is being there, which is being uh, mouthed, uh, but it, it doesn't really exist. So a visible, discernible, lively, successful engagement with diversity is pluralism, if we can do that. Therefore, let me conclude with just one sentence, uh, that is, while diversity is a given, pluralism is something that needs to be achieved. And I think all of us have to endeavor towards that. Thank you very much. Shukriya. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, uh, very uh, interesting lecture. And in between, just I especially thank those who raised questions. We really approach towards completeness of this lecture because any lecture, any activity in the university should not end up what the state is doing for us or what we have. But we should also raise questions and what state is not doing and what we are really lacking in the society. Uh, with utmost uh, uh, humility and gratitude, I now invite Professor Sayyid Anul Hassan, Honorable Vice Chancellor Manu, to share his remarks and thoughts on the issue. Uh, Professor Kalam, boys and girls, this was very interesting, in fact. I mean, he covered up, you know, a range of issues, you know, I mean, said globally. It's not just he was not confined to our Indian territory, rather he was talking about Canada, America, Russia, Africa, you know. But yes, diversity, to what extent diversity versus pluralism and to what extent pluralism. Finally, the analysis is made and the judgment has pronounced, is pronounced. And the judgment is that the only way is unity in diversity. That is really crux of the matter. And I appreciate there were few important aspects. And definitely, these are to be discussed in G20 summit. Global warming is one which is, you know, obviously every country will talk about, even countries invited to participate as a guest. Like you mentioned Bangladesh and then Singapore and Mauritius. The UAE is invited. 
to participate in G20 summit. But the question will remain. There is no answer from any country, any nation, that this brunt which we are bearing today, now you see we are expecting in the first week of June, monsoon will arrive in Hyderabad. Still there is no clue. So this is how you see we have to think about it. To what extent, you know, on one hand diversity, on, on the other hand people dying. You must have read in newspapers also the kind of heat generated here. So therefore, in many ways, diversities are to be discussed, you see. And India is known for diversity. India is too big and too diverse. This is true. Too big and too diverse. He cited example of Manipur now. You are absolutely calm and quiet here. I'm not talking about you particularly, but you see, a large chunk is quiet. And what is happening there, you see, one should realize how people live there today in such an insurgency. Now, we have another multiculturalism. He talked about multiculturalism. Yes, it is there. And this is also, you see, multiculturalism means diversities are there. A combination of, vari of various cultures. This is true. In India, you can see through your naked eyes. And this is not something new, which we say that, look, it's age-old phenomena. Right from the birth of Adam and Eve, we have seen diversities. Two sons of Adam, how diverse they were. You can think about Habil and Qabil. So right from the very beginning, you can you can see diversities. You see, diversities in thought processes, diversities in functioning, in amal, in karma. There are diversities. You you take my army, but I will be with your opponent. So on one hand, single person; on the other hand, the entire army is fighting against this. You know, your own army. So this is happening, you see, the idea is too, too diverse and this is how, you see, we carry forward. We have, you know, geopolitical conditions are such where we have to be a little extra cautious because this is changing very rapidly, you see, regime after regime, things are changing, changing in a very, very distinct manner. Our neighborhood, you see, what role they play. And then some, some way or other, maybe a conflict just on the basis of the flow of rivers. You have seen within the southern part of India that, look, I mean, one river, you see, under question, you see, to what extent my jurisdiction, to what extent your, your jurisdiction, these things are happening, you see. But yes, amicably you can decide, but you cannot decide anything by force. You cannot forcefully, forcefully encroach upon others' rights. Then, what is happening? How India, to, India is to, you know, represent you know, Indian concerns, Indian concerns, you see, what India is, this is the best opportunity in G20, India should represent India. What, what is our idea? How we think about the issues, this is also important. When you are inviting some guests also, G20, 20 nation, entire European Union is there. So you should come out, you see. My suggestion would be that, okay, let us represent India. This is the best opportunity. And how we can represent India? Yes, that's how you see when Dr. Saab says that, look, diversity and unity in diversity. This should be the major highlight of this summit. I believe, I personally believe, 
as you mentioned, you know, about Diana, in fact. But you should see tradition and modernity, you see, you should capture both. You cannot give up one. You say that, look, we are modern, we, we, are, we are totally cut off from our tradition. You cannot do this. You know, varieties of mangoes and then the hybrids. Look at diversity, you say, are you talking about diversity of human beings, you see? There are diversity of fruits also. I mean, today, you say, it's a season for mangoes. Everybody is tasting mangoes, you see? How many types of mangoes? You come to my house, at least I can offer you right now, you see, I can offer you ten types of mangoes. Within Hyderabad you will find these, Amman Benishan and then uh, uh, some, uh, you know, huh? No, no, Bagan Pali and then, uh, you, you see, Langla is also here, Dasari is also here, Alfonso is also here, so many varieties and then the combination which you don't know the name. So these are really diversities we should enjoy, we should preserve. And this is not something new I am telling you, this is age old, right from the beginning of the evolution and the process of evolution, it is started. So what we are enjoying, Mirza Ghalib wrote, charagh e a narrative poem in Persian, charagh e And Daina comes in the, this, the city of light, you see, talks about light. Mirza Ghalib had already talked about charagh e you see. And about darkness, you see, who talks about darkness? Only Zoroastrians were there, you see, who said that you lit a candle and then you will see there is a dark area beneath the candle. That is the territory of Ahraman and Ahriman, you see. Ahraman and Ahriman both were distinct, in fact. Now we got nothing to do with darkness. We are closely associated with the light. And that's how Khurshid and Yaish, when sun comes, there is a life. When sun goes in the darkness, you see, there is no life. So these things are really to be preserved, you see, in the hearts and minds of people, in fact. Instead of talking about, you see, I am different, you are different, nobody is different. You say Banaras, Banaras on one hand, thick population of Muslims. On the bank of Ganges, you will find total Hindu population, mostly occupied by the Pandas, in fact, not Pandit, Pandas, you see. They are the bosses of ghats, in fact. They are offering prayers, they are offering pujas. So they are dominant people, in fact. But it's a wonderful combination, as you said. They are distinct. Their identities are different, but yes, they are together. When they are producing a sari, Banarsi sari, who is buying? These pandas are buying. Who is selling? They, they are in the market, you see. But the kind of rehabilitation and the support and then electricity and then uh, some freebies they are going on, you see. It's a very, very entangled branch. You can't separate them. <coughs> This is how you see the diversity comes to the rescue of unity. Isn't it, sir? So you're, you're really well taken. I mean, this is a point, in fact. But I will go a little beyond that. Why a little beyond? That when I say that there is, there is a must, there must be some, something to be represented from within India. And what is in India? In India, I think, let if we can bring, here is my student sitting there, you see, we can bring Jalaluddin Rumi here, Rumi, where Rumi says that what is my identity? When you say, you cannot confine, you see, you cannot draw a 
a line that look i mean this is how you see we will we will stay within that and we'll confine ourselves within that boundary or within that territory within that four walls no should come out because you are talking at global level in a summit which is global summit g20 means so you have involved all you know stakeholders you are not alone so therefore if we bring rumi here when he says what is my identity he says neither i belong to the land nor sea nor the jungle of africa nor the garden of eden neither from dust nor from water neither from east nor the west nor neither from north nor nor from south nor neither from this continent nor for that continent neither from asia nor from africa what is my identity my identity rumi says my identity is love and i am for the beloved and here ends the matter when you consider everyone as your lover and everyone will be loved by all and that will be the day when you can say that diversity has created unity amongst us and i wish all the best to you sir for uh, delivering a very informative and very uh, contentious also because you know within a short span of time you can't deliver everything but yes there are people who will question about the present day environment and the past you see they correlate but you have to correlate your tradition and modernity also to what extent you can go beyond modernity to what extent you can give up your tradition i think if you combine them then only you can think about your unity in diversity thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir uh now i invite uh, uh, dr kem ziaudin my respected colleague and associate professor of uh, department of sociology to offer a word of thanks assalamu alaikum this is indeed a great pleasure to hear professor m a kalam uh, who has been an inspiration not only inspirations but inspiring force to many of the young scholars country wide and uh, personally i do read his regular columns he writes and i'm happy that sir uh, has that courtesy to share and uh, give a space to read his thoughts about the non anthropological non sociological at times we feel you know this is from the out of the track which was which he was basically talking uh and and that makes a sociologist and anthropologist alive uh, when you are writing when you are critically locating the social context so throughout the lecture uh, i'm sure all these issues are the core areas of a student who study in any discipline of social sciences which sir has reflected upon and i'm sure you all will take away uh, keep in your classroom keep in your hostel room and debate on those issues that will make lot of uh, 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 critical reflections in our lives so i thank professor kalam for giving such an exhaustive and elaborate lecture uh, for the uh, collaborative program today uh, on behalf of the department of sociology uh, in collaboration with the center for social exclusion and inclusive policy uh, definitely uh, uh, what professor sayed anul hasan our honorable vice chancellor concluded was very important take away for all of us that uh, we india had never a uh, tough time in terms of understanding diversity and pluralism the project of pluralism came from west but india already had these in practices in everyday life the problem is that locating the, those contexts the, the notion of pluralism and diversity at various time various locations uh, various socio political context will give you a different meaning to those things and these are the some important take away from uh, our honorable vice chancellor's concluding remarks i thank on behalf of the department and center uh, for your kind full presence and definitely giving uh, sir that uh, i was you know thinking that uh, we had a image in jnu that
uh, outside of JNU, any faculty who listen on Urdu from background of Urdu, Arabic, and other languages, they not be exposed talking on social sciences. The kind of caliber we see in our Honorable Vice Chancellor's lecture, uh, it is very difficult and challenging, but then we feel that a sociologist is, uh, is talking about an anthropologist is there in his experiences. And, and this is how uh, uh, there is a live, lively and vibrant uh, uh, you know, guidance coming from our Honorable Vice Chancellor. So on behalf of the department, I'm again thankful to you for giving your precious time. I'm also uh, thankful and uh, place my congratulations to the head of the department for organizing such a wonderful lecture today. Though we had a rigorous internal assignments going on, uh, the hall is full, so that shows that this program is very successful event uh, when the semester is also ending. And, and I also congratulate to the all the staff and thank to the staff of Social Exclusion Studies, now very small center as of now, but they have been doing great work in the area of social sciences, bringing so many of us together. I also thank our colleagues from Instructional Media Center and Engineering Sections, who all are sitting here in the right side. Uh, I also thank all the dear students and research students for coming up with very important questions. Some of them may be unaddressed, but uh, definitely those questions were very relevant and, and I, I thank everyone sitting in the room, friends sitting there, Dr. Firoz Alam, Dr. Kaisar Ahmed, and one important guest uh, in the first row we had Dr. Hashmi. Uh, he is, I'm told he is one of the notable doctor, I mean, uh, not doctorate, but the doctor who practices in clinics, uh, came far away from Kompali and be here in the, so thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, and I thank the all panelists here.